Stand with me if you would, please, and hold your Bibles up. Welcome all of you watching online. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God, and I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I will never be the same again. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to take just a moment and uh, appreciate my friend, uh, Jesse Bufford, who preached for me last weekend. And um, Jesse and I have been preaching together a long time. And tonight, I have to go on his turf. We go, uh, we go to prison tonight, and we do church in prison, and I'll be preaching for him and, uh, but we'll be celebrating him, too. For over 30 years, he's dedicated his life to inmates. He's seen a lot, heard a lot, and it is a tough task. And, Jesse, we honor you and appreciate you. Thank you. It's, uh, every time I think about going with him, and I've done this before, uh, it's really strange. Uh, it's, this tonight will be at an all-women's prison. And uh, the last time I preached for him, I finished preaching, and uh, one of the inmates came up to me and said, uh, uh, you're, you're from Berry Hill? I said, yeah. She said, well, do you know my brother? And she gave me his name, and I said, yeah. He played football. We, I knew who he was. I watched him, and, and uh, she said, told me her name. And, and uh, come to find out, it's really strange. We grew up in the same community, a little sm small country community, and... Uh, she had uh, gone through a divorce, and, and it was really an ugly one and had three children, and she didn't want her husband to see him, so she took all three of the kids' lives. And uh, that's the kind of stuff that he has to deal with. And it shocked me because I knew her. I knew her family. And, uh, you know, sometimes good people do bad things. And uh, I think that's what I have to remind myself is these are not bad people. They just made some really bad choices. And so I think we have to, as we go in tonight, I'm asking for your prayers because after every door closes behind me, it's scary. Clink, clink, clink. <laughs> Jesse's like, no, I, they're going to let me out. They might not let you out, but I'm getting out. I got 30 years of getting out of here. This may be your night. And so uh, anyway, I've, I've been praying about just the, what to say because what, what do you say? You know, I mean, I don't even know how he does it, coming up with messages like, you know, your destiny. Well, some of them's destiny is you're in here for life. And so what do I do behind walls? How do I make a difference? And so this series on True North is, is more about uh, a lot of things than, than we think. Uh, when I talked about it initially, I was talking about us initially, just every one of us staying focused in our lives and moving toward God. And Jesus, of course, is our true north. And Every decision we make and every thought that we process needs to go through him. And, uh, but I was thinking through it, and I thought, you know, it, it, how, do I, how do I get there? And then I thought about this message, which is the closing message for True North, is the reason being is we've got to get other people pointed in that direction. Um. It's important not just because sometimes we think about our own salvation. And I don't know how many of you have a day, a week, a minute, a month, a year where you, you know, things just haven't gone well. You haven't made a lot of good decisions and, and uh, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he comes to steal your confidence, steal your faith, steal your joy, uh, to kill any hopes and dreams that you might have. That's his job. And not necessarily to kill your body because that's just, you know, that's going to happen someday. We all pass. But, but he loves to steal and kill and destroy any hopes and dreams that we have. And um, so it's important that we not just think about those things, but that's what he wants. He wants you to think about only you and am I going to heaven? Am, am I doing everything right? And those are things that are important, but we're saved by grace through faith. You're not saved because you're a good person. You're not saved because you've done everything right. You're not saved because you're perfect, you're excellent, you're all of that. You're simply saved, as am I, because of the grace of God and that we accept that. And now with that said, uh, we have to make sure that we pass that message along 
to other people. And oftentimes, you say, well, that's easy. It's not really easy because when we start talking to other people about the Lord, we oftentimes begin to measure where they are by how they behave, how they speak, how they dress. And none of those things count. What counts is our faith in Jesus Christ. And it's very easy to become judgmental. It's very easy to try to tell other people how to live and uh, how not to live and what not to do. But the reality is our job is to simply love and keep pointing toward Jesus. Uh, I was on my weekly call with pastors from all over the world. And one yesterday was in Barcelona, Spain, where he lives. And, and uh, he was an editor at, way back in the day. We both grew up in Tulsa. And I didn't know he'd been on the call every week. And I thought I recognized his name. But yesterday, neither one of us got the message that it wasn't going to happen. So three of us joined the Zoom call and nobody else joins. And so we're, we're, we're all going, where's everybody? We were waiting and waiting, and then we went, I guess they're not going to be here. So I started talking to him, and he said he used to edit for one of the major ministries in America. I mean, not just in America, around the world. And he said that, that the, and I knew the guy that he was talking about, great man of God, and he's no longer with us, but built this great ministry. And he said when we would do his books, that when I when I would do the covers and, and acknowledgments and all that, he said I would, he would constantly kick a book back to me if his name was too big on the book. He said, we're not here preaching me. We're here preaching Jesus. And so it was a great statement and a reminder to me that our lives are not necessarily to reflect who we are, what we've done, our success, how great, titles and all that. Our job is to demonstrate and show people the love of Jesus Christ. And uh, if we can do that, the Bible says love never fails. <clears throat> so I'm going to read out of Colossians chapter 2. This is out of the Message Bible, and it will bring it home kind of clearly. Because here's what happens. Um, you may have faith for something that somebody else doesn't have faith for. You may be okay with doing something somebody else doesn't feel is okay. Paul had this problem in the church of Corinth where they were having dinner and, and they had meat that had been sacrificed to idols. Well, that didn't mean anything to Paul because he focused on Jesus and he didn't believe that meat sacrificed to idols, whether you ate it or didn't eat it, didn't matter. But there were a group of people that didn't have the same faith that Paul had. And they wouldn't eat it. And so Paul t walks us through this. If they don't eat, don't eat it in front of them. In other words, honor their lack of faith, if you will, or their difference. Don't try to force them to be you. And sometimes I think we want people to be like us because we want them to validate what we believe so that we don't think we're wrong. And so I think the toughest thing in Christianity is loving people who are different than us that dress different than us, that talk different than us, uh, that, that there are so many different things that cause us to get our focus off of true north, which is Jesus. And I've been around people before that some people say they weren't saved because maybe their language or how they lived or didn't live. And all I know is this, that the only way any of us get to heaven is through Jesus Christ, our true north, and through faith in him. That's it. And now, it doesn't mean that we're not constantly trying to improve our faith, improve on how much we love people and how much grace we extend. And I think that's so very, very important, and I think the body of Christ is moving in the right direction, but we have to continue to move in that direction. <clears throat> so, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 out of the Message Bible, So then, if with Christ you put all that pretentious and infantile religion behind you, why do you let yourselves be bullied by it? In other words, what he's saying is there are religious people who want you to believe exactly what they believe. And if you don't, you're probably not a Christian. You're probably not going to heaven. And that has cost a lot of people their relationship with the local church. There may be even their relationship with God that says, you know, I'm just not good enough to be a Christian. 
I, I don't do right according to this person, and that person tells me I'm not dressing right. And the list goes on of people judging us and making us question our salvation. The only reason I don't question my salvation is not because I'm always good, but because he's always good and he's always full of grace. That's the only thing that keeps me. Because there are moments I even question in my life, you know, even to the point where if I honk at you and, and when you're driving because that's my thing, and God gave us horns for that reason. That's why they're on cars. So I think that you ought to use the horn at equal level that you use the turn signal. Anyway, some of you will get that. Some of you won't because some of you don't use the turn signal. So anyway, I know because you should have, okay. So anyway, it goes on to say, don't touch this, don't taste that, don't go near this. Do you think things that are here today and gone tomorrow are worth that kind of attention? Such things sound impressive if said in a deep enough voice. They even give the illusion of being pious and humble and aesthetic. But they're just another way of showing off, making yourselves look important so in other words when you get around people that are different and you see differences it's very easy to start letting your compass go toward them go toward give attention to something that is not deserving of attention and start judging and measuring against what you believe and your own personal convictions Yes, we ought to all have personal convictions. We all ought to own those personal convictions. I'm in a different place today with Christ than I was in 1977, which now seems like an eternity ago. And I'm in a different place. So what does that mean? I understand more about God than I did then. I understand more about grace and faith and love and patience and kindness and gentleness and meekness and self. I understand more. Uh, there are people who started out their walk with God, didn't believe in healing, didn't believe in miracles. They got sick one day, decided to pray. God did a miracle. Now they believe in miracles. The, the, the journey with Christ, we call it sanctification. I hesitate to use the word evolution or evolving. Now, I don't mean in terms of we came from frogs, but I'm talking evolutionary thoughts that you grow in your relationship with God and you evolve into a more comfortable relationship. And some people hate this word comfort, but I have a comfortable relationship with God, not because I'm better, but because I understand him better and understand who he is. And so it keeps me from fighting and arguing the way I used to over theological issues because the one issue that I will debate is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. That's it. And so if, if we were to get into a debate with somebody over something that wasn't worthy of that, then it causes people around us to begin to question their faith and their salvation. And it's very, very important that we walk in love, that we walk in grace, that we walk in mercy. That's the mantra of the Mosaic House, the church, is love never fails. And that grace, where sin abounds, grace does more abound, mercy triumphs over judgment. And this is not like, uh, let's just go be stupid and do our own thing without considering God and God's purpose and God's will. It's not what I'm saying. But... When you know someone well enough that you can have a bad day in front of them, it's comforting. And it, there are people that don't want you to have a bad day, don't want you to be honest, and don't want you to, to share maybe your flaws. Uh, you don't feel comfortable around them because they'll judge you. And so some people have that kind of relationship with God. It's what I call a religious relationship because... We're constantly hiding things from God or not telling God the truth. If I have a bad day, there are times I go to God and say, this is just really not working well. <laughs> and it's not like God's going, oh, my goodness. It's like he knows every thought, every emotion, every pain, every hurt, every struggle. And it's important for us to be honest with God and, and to be as honest with those that we're comfortable with. Now, listen to me very carefully. There are people that cannot handle your problems. So you can't share your problems with them. You can't share the hurt with them. You can't do that. So you find the right people. And, and there are two different things. There's secrecy and privacy. Secrecy 
is to hide things that are harmful. Privacy is to protect things that are godly. And so there are things, secrets of your heart or private things of your heart that you don't share with everybody because they wouldn't understand. And so I've, I was uh, asked to preach in a free will Baptist church one time, and it was very difficult. I was with a friend of mine who was actually trying out to become the pastor of this church in Houston. He asked me to go with him. And uh, how many of you know that you take a Pentecostal to a free will Baptist church, all kinds of excitement can happen. And uh, but but at that time, I was at least smart enough to know, you know, just behave. Don't become your Pentecostal self, you know. And so when we got there, uh, he had preached and they asked me to preach. It was a moment, but I, I did everything according to what they believed. OK, because I was I'm not going to try to convince them to be me or what I believe. At the end of the message, rather than offering him the job, they offered me the job. And I, I just politely said, I don't think you want me. <laughs> I, said, uh, I said, let's just leave it there. You don't want me. You want my buddy Joe, and uh, I think that would be a good choice for you. Um, but the, the point being is at that point, it was really a miracle that that, that happened because that I was too young to really know how to respond to that had it not been God saying, don't blow this church up, they're really trying. And so I didn't. Um, and so the thing that we have to remember is that it takes time to earn the trust and the confidence of certain people. And uh, my mother grew up in a family of seven. She had four siblings, so there were a total of seven in her family. For some reason, my mother was the only one in the family that somehow got into church at a very early age, and she fell in love with Jesus, and all of her life, she served the Lord. Her uh, three sisters were really wonderful people. She had one brother, another wonderful guy, good family, but none of them went to church. And so they all lived in Tulsa, and most of them lived within just a, a few blocks of each other. One of them was further away. They would come in at Christmas and have Christmas together, and I'll never forget that they would gather at our house or one of the houses, and we would, as kids, we'd be dragged along, had a bunch of cousins. And my mother was constantly, politely, respectfully sharing Jesus with them. And I'll never forget they they were very kind, but they were very mocking of her, and they discounted her. And uh, my mother never, ever wavered from true north. She never got mean, but she continued to stay north. She continued every year, year after year, she'd share Jesus with them. She'd talk about God. And I, you, you think, well, that's not a big deal. It's a big deal if you're looking at four siblings and their spouses. Now you've got eight people that don't go to church, and, and at best, they have this very little relationship with God. But over time, it, it began to work. Over time, one by one. And finally, my uncle, who was a, uh, in the military, he was a pilot, a major, very intelligent man. And sometimes intelligent people are the toughest to reach. And, and so he was one of the toughest to reach. And I'll never forget, my mother just continued true north. I'm just going to keep... I'm just going to keep talking about Jesus. I'm going to keep being kind. I'm not going to judge anybody. One by one, they all started falling in line. And the final one was my major pilot uncle who gave his life to Jesus. And when he did, he could not shut up. I mean, he could not. I was, in, I was going through theology school and I was in college and and he would always seek me out, and he would just want to sit and talk about the Bible for hours and hours. It was the most interesting thing. And then finally, out of all the siblings, all of them got born again but one. And then on the last day of his life, he was walking, doing a walk, and uh, he was at a park outside of Tulsa. A bunch of older people would walk there, and he collapsed walking. And when he did, people came around, and... Uh, they saw that he was probably not going to make it, and, and he, they heard him say, I believe, I believe. On his dying day, he believed. And, you know, just in that one moment, but my mother kept pointing people to Jesus. You think 
some people aren't going to make it. And, and as a result, you give up. You quit talking about Jesus. You just think it's not worth it. They're going to get angry. But if you keep loving them and you keep pointing them toward Jesus and you keep loving them toward Jesus and you keep your walk with Jesus, it'll change everything. And I may have shared this a couple of weeks ago, but uh, Mark, who plays the guitar over here, Mark Ryan, who I dearly love, appreciate, respect, and forever will, we did a podcast together, and he asked me, he said, what is the difference in Mark Crow now and, and Mark Crow 10 years ago? And it was really a response I'd, I'd never really thought of, and I said, I think probably the primary difference is that most of my life I've worked for God. You said, well, I work for God. I said, but now my goal is to walk with God, not to work for God. And it, because the reality is, yeah, faith without works is dead, but our call is to have such a relationship with God that we walk with him. And that that's whatever our vocation, our profession, whatever that is, that we stay focused on him. You know, many years ago, uh, my hero, one of my still heroes who's now with Jesus is Billy Graham. And uh, I've been interested in his story most of my life, read up on it. And I went back this morning to re be reminded of all the layers of people that were responsible for leading Billy Graham to Jesus Christ. And here's the list. It began with a Sunday school teacher by the name of Edward Kimball. He was asked to teach a Sunday school class, didn't want to, but finally gave in at his local church and teach a Sunday school class, not thinking that he would have any impact whatsoever. Wilbur Kimball, Edward Kimball, leads D.L. Moody to Jesus Christ. Well, D.L. Moody was a shoe salesman. And so he is in the class. D.L. Moody comes to accept Christ. And then D.L. Moody, who sold, sold shoes, a guy came in by the name of Wilbur Chapman. He began sharing his faith and pointing Wilbur Chapman toward north, talking about Jesus. So it's not a big deal. It's just Wilbur Chapman. Nobody knows Wilbur Chapman. Well, nobody knew Edward Kimball either. And at that time, nobody knew D.L. Moody because he was just a shoe salesman. See, this is what devil does is you're really not going to make a difference in your profession. Listen, some of y'all will make a better difference greater difference than I will as a pastor because you're touching people that I will never get to touch until you touch them. Never discount your relationship and your voice and your influence over the people that you're around. And then after Wilbur Chapman, Wilbur Chapman runs into a guy named Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was a professional baseball player. So Billy Sunday was already successful, but somebody got to him with Jesus Christ this guy that none of us know and none of us have ever heard of doesn't get any accolades, nothing. But all of a sudden, Billy Sunday just gets so born again and so turned on to Jesus that he quits professional baseball. Then Billy Sunday runs into a guy named Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham is a guy that you've probably never heard of and probably never will again, except that it's a funny name. And you'll remember because Mordecai Ham, what a name. Can you imagine a mother that would do that? And so Mordecai Ham had such a love for Jesus that one day he's preaching in this small town in North Carolina. And there was a, this house of ill repute, what they called it, across the street from the high school. A lot of the high schoolers were going over there. But there was one man by the name at that time, Billy Franks, what they called him that decided to go hear Mordecai Ham preach, and that man, who was then known as Billy Frank, became Billy Graham. So you see, all of this takes place over a series of time, layers of people that you never know who you're impacting. You never know the power of your influence and what it's going to do in somebody's life. So here's what I say to people. Number one, if you're taking notes, make your life balance. Keep your life in balance. I remember being so extreme, and, and I, I mean, there used to be these funny sayings is, you know, you're a freak, when you say, well, at least I'm a Jesus freak, whose freak are you? All this stuff that we used to say that was silly back in the day. But he, he became, you know, you, 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 you get this in this place where you're such a Jesus freak that you scare people away. You run them off. So when I first got born again, I would find myself at the Mardi Gras, I would be preaching in, 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 on the streets of Mardi Gras. Then I, I, I would 
take a team to New York City and do plays in the Bronx of New York City. And uh, we'd take it to the streets. And it wasn't that we were pushing, but it was, it was very hard when you got people that are so resistant that you're coming on their turf and you're sharing Jesus Christ. And over time, there's nothing wrong with that. I've got a friend to this day who carries a cross all over the world. And, and we have different strengths and, and different reasons and destinies and purpose. You have a purpose, and you have to identify what that is. But the number one thing is that whatever you do, always do it in love and always share it with a smile. People don't need to know how bad they are. They already know. People don't need to be told they're a sinner. When I was a sinner, I knew I was a sinner. I just didn't know how to become an unsinner. Because I thought to become something different than I was, that I would have to become perfect to get there. Every one of us has a past. And your past is simply a platform to your future. If you use it right. Many people use their past as an anchor to prevent them from being who everything God wants them to be. And instead of saying, you know what? That taught me a lesson. I don't want to be that. I want to be somebody else. I want to be something else. The greatest crisis in my life became the greatest revelation in my life. Some of you don't know who you are. I didn't know who I was. I knew who you wanted me to be. I knew who others wanted me to be. But I really didn't think that much about who God wanted me to be. And I realize now in my life that the greatest gift I have to others is to be operating in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I grew up cutting my teeth with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're both necessary. But if you have the gifts of the Spirit without the fruit of the Spirit, you're going to be a clanging symbol. And so as powerful as the gifts of the Holy Spirit are, and I believe in every one of them, I found that the greatest foundation for the gifts of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. And so that now when I have something to say, I want to say it in a way that's redemptive, not punitive, that lifts somebody up, not puts somebody down. I don't want to put you in your place. I want to help you find your place in God. And you know what? Sometimes you have to face the hard facts about what you've done or haven't done in order to get there and know that God's okay. God is not shocked. So what we have to do is we have to make, put life in balance. How do I do that? First off, you have to create priorities. What are your priorities? What are the things that are really not just important to you, but important to God? We're living, you say, well, that's not a big deal. It's a really big deal because priorities over the last six, seven decades have changed drastically. There's no longer a priority to be in church. It's not a priority. It's, it's, a, it's a part of our lives in, in some people's, but it's not a priority. And, and it saddens me, not because church saves us, because it doesn't, but church feeds us. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And, and you know, back in the day, and, and this, this sounds terrible. I never thought I'd get old enough to say stuff like this. But there were no businesses open. I mean, Chick-fil-A now and Swadley's Barbecue, they don't open on Sundays anymore. They decided, you know what? And both of them would tell you those were our busiest days. We made more money than we made any other day. And they decided we're going to shut down because church and the house of God and worship is a priority. You got Hobby Lobby. Not open. We want, our, we want our, our employees to be able to go to church on Sunday. Now, please, don't take this condemnation if you're not in church every week. That's not what this is about. It can still be a priority even if you're not here every week because there are things you have to do. There are things you want to do. And there are things you should do. But every Sunday that I'm not here, you have no idea how hard it is for me. I hate not being here, but I also know that I got to refresh myself. I, I can't, I mean, if you think about songwriters, these songs are sung week after week, year after year, and they've been around a long time. A pastor has to write a new message every week. Jesse. It's like there have been Fridays I've go, okay, God, what are you up to here? Uh, you're not talking. If you ain't talking, I ain't talking, because if I talk without you talking, it ain't going to work. And so there have been Fridays where I, I'm like desperate before God. Oh, please tell me what to say. It, give me three points in a poem. Give me something. But that's what we do every week. So when I'm gone, it's my mind. I have to give my mind a break 52 weekends a year. So Jesse and I have been doing this together for a long time. 
And uh, it's one of those things where you have to find that balance in life. So my priority used to be, i got to be there every Sunday. It ain't going to work without me. If this church doesn't work without me, it's built on the wrong person. This church will work without me. And, and it's okay. But, but we have to understand that it's, every one of us has to take a time of refreshing and some of y'all grind it out for God, and, and I'm thankful for everything you do and everyone that's here. And when you're not here, I miss you. And hopefully when I'm not here, you miss me at least a little bit. There's a little ego problem here, okay? So anyway, it's important that we establish priorities. Uh, I'll never forget, and this is one of the things that, that I, 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 in my transition, uh, my two youngest sons, and I were scheduled to go to a NASCAR race in Nashville, and everything had been taken care of. Somebody in the church actually owned a plane. They said, we want to fly you and your two boys, and, and that we were all, I told my boys, and I remember they were young, and uh, it was at a time when uh, the Passion of the Christ was coming out, and Mel Gibson and Jim Caviezel, and, and it was a big deal. It was the, the Jews, and I mean, it was a big fight. Some of you may remember, or maybe you don't, but the Jewish people were mad at Mel because it, the, the, they crucified Christ, and Mel made it very clear how the whole thing worked out. And so I got a call from uh, 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 the people that were putting all this together, and they said, uh, you know, we, we'd like for you to come. Mel's going to be there. There's going to be a few people, and we're going to talk about the movie. And, and uh, they said, well, we can't tell you what time, and we can tell you where because we don't want the media there. So I said, well, I'd, I'd love to do that. And so I said, give me a call when when uh, when this is going to happen and so they call me like a day before that I was supposed to fly with my kids to Nashville to this race and they said now tomorrow we're going to be at thus and so place Mel Gibson's going to be there and I thought that's a big deal I mean Mel Gibson is Mel Gibson you know and then Jim Caviezel and, and the whole movie thing was great and as I prayed about it I called him back and I said you know what can't do it I said I promised my two boys we'd go to Nashville and that's where we're going is a priority in my life that I remember thinking back, and I've never regretted that for a moment. There are times you make hard decisions, but if you don't have priorities, you may oftentimes make the wrong decision. And had I not done that, it would have been the wrong decision because my boys are more important than Mel Gibson. What I didn't realize was years later, I would have the opportunity to spend two or three days with Jesus, Jim Caviezel, and, uh, and get to talk to him and hang out with him and, and about the whole movie privately, which was better than Mel Gibson because Mel wasn't Jesus. Jim was. And so if we want to stay pointed north, you need to list your priorities. What's important to you, really important, not what's urgent, what's important because there will always be things that are urgent that will scream, I'm important, but they're not important. They're simply urgent. And you get to those. Even when Jesus, remember when Lazarus is dying and, and they come and tell Jesus, the one you love is dying. Jesus didn't, and Jesus like, chill. He didn't do anything. He stayed there. And the, the disciples are shocked because this is a guy you love. But Jesus said, it's not, basically didn't say it in the word, it's not urgent, it's important, and I'll get there. He gets there, and what happens? Lazarus died. But Jesus says, I'll take care of it. It was important, but it wasn't urgent. And if you don't have a list of priorities laid out for you, there's a really good chance you'll make a lot of wrong decisions. So if you can say, what, what are the priorities in my life? My relationship with God, my relationship with the Bible, my relationship with the church, my relationship with believers, my relationship with testimony to other people. Those are priorities that I'm going to have to take advantage of. And if I don't make it a priority, it may not happen. Second thing is in life, making your life balance is people. Ask yourself the question, do the people that I associate with regularly contribute to my faith or do they drain my faith? Do they make me a better person or do they make me a worse person? Do they build up my walk with God? Or do they tear down my walk with God? You have to be prepared because the Bible says those who walk with the wise will grow wise. But a companion of fools comes to ruin. Some of you are literally one friendship away from doing better. Getting rid of the one friend. 
that continually drains you of your walk with God. They continue to attack you for going to church. Why do you go to church? Why do you believe that? Wait, are you one of those crazy Christian people that believe in healing? I am. Do I believe in miracles? I do. Do I believe in prophecy? I do. Let me just say this to you. The things that we believe in are supernatural, and they don't make sense to the natural mind. And so whenever someone comes at you, your supernatural faith with a natural thought, it's always going to be in conflict, and you're going to have to stand strong. And so it's very difficult sometimes because it's not understandable. I don't understand how one man 2,000 years ago plus could die on a cross for the sins of every human being, past, present, and future, if we simply believe. Now, if you can wrap your mind around that, you're Einstein plus. Because it still, in the natural, does not make sense that one man could take the sins of all mankind, take them upon himself, be crucified, be raised from the dead, and then forgive all of us who are not even born yet. But that's what Jesus does. And so we have to make sure that we stay strong in our faith with him. Psalm 1, Psalm uh, chapter 1 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but delight, uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Planted in the right place. You're not hanging around with people all the time who are mocking God and mocking you. Now, if you're going to do that like my mother had to, you just stay simply strong and stay pointed north. You're not going to be talked out of it. You're not going to be walked out of it. You're going to stay strong. You have to. But the minute that begins to waver, you have to make a tough decision. And then in Psalm 92, it says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the court of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. I'm not old, but I'm older. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no wickedness in him. Then the last thing is, after your priorities and the people, is purpose. Always remember your purpose. Some of you are still searching for it, maybe. But you have a purpose for being here. You're not an accident. And where you are right now is no accident. This is a part of your purpose. Oftentimes, you can be sitting here listening to me or someone else preach. And God will override my voice with a still small voice in you. It's what happened to me in January 3rd of 2016, sitting in church by myself, just sitting there. I'm not preaching. I'm out, done. And all of a sudden, it was like a curtain pulled in front of the guy that was preaching. And God began to speak to my heart. And that was when he said, what are you doing here? When God asks you what you're doing somewhere, you better tell him the truth. And I said to him in response, you don't understand. Second mistake, telling the creator of heaven and earth you don't understand. And that In that moment, I realized my purpose was not diminished or revoked by my sin. My purpose remained the same because of him. And sometimes we think that our purpose no longer exists because of something we did, but it's because of what he did that keeps our purpose, purpose intact. But the devil would love to talk you out of your purpose because your purpose, that's where your anointing is, is inside your purpose. I, I'm not anointed to do a lot of things. Matter of fact, before I started coming back preaching, I started thinking about things to do, and I couldn't think of anything. 
it was like God shut everything down. I thought, I'm not good at a lot of stuff. And I had to really kind of reinvent the idea that the gifts and callings, according to the word of God, are without repentance. They're irrevocable. And there were people, and I'm not trying to be mean, but there were people that thought that God revoked his call on my life to preach because of a sin in my life. And I promised God that I would not waste the sin that I committed, that I would commit that to him, and that I would do everything in my power not to come back to church, but to come back to the right place with him. And when I did, there was my purpose. It had never changed. God's purpose for you has never changed. And so those of you who have given up because you think you've done too much, you cannot out the cross of Christ. You cannot out the love of God. That doesn't mean that we have a license to be stupid. It just means that we have an understanding that when we are, he said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Stay true. Get your priorities in place. As we approach a new year, your priorities will shift. Some of you will have children. Some of your children will leave home. That's a wonderful priority shift. Um, when you have to go, it, it's different. It is different. I mean, every season of life comes with differences and different opportunities. And, but our purpose remains the same, and we have to stay focused on that when the shift comes. So stay true north. And why? Because there are people watching you that need you to lead them in the direction of Christ. They don't need you to judge them. They don't need to, they need you to tell them they're a sinner. Let me tell you, they know it. And that's the problem is they know it. And oftentimes we confirm it instead of saying, you don't have to be who you are. You could be who God made you. If you'll just turn to him and all he asks for, this is a wonderful thing. I wish I'd have heard this early on. All God really wanted from me, it sounds terrible. He wanted my sin. He wanted my sin. Who wants your sin? God wants your sin. That's what he came to get. And we withhold that from him, thinking that we can give him our work so we can give him our religious behavior. We can do everything right. That becomes our goal. When all God's saying is, would you please give me your sin? I paid for it already. I came. I want it. Give it to me. And if you'll give me your sin, I'll give you my life. That's all it takes. And then once you do and you commit to that, yeah, the devil will come to try to steal all of that. But stay focused on him. Not on how good you are, but how good he is. He'll take care of everything. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for um, being a light shining in darkness. And Lord, we thank you that we may bend, but we're not going to break. God, we're going to keep leaning and fighting and stay planted in truth. We're going to stay planted in church. We're going to stay planted in faith. God, we're not going to move. We're going to be immovable. When the world and the winds of this world and the tests and the trials come, Lord, we're just going to fight even harder to keep turned towards you, that our compass will point north all the time. That God, even though it wobbles and the needle moves and shakes and does different things, God, we're going to stay firm. We're going to stay strong. And we're going to stay focused. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask all of you to pray this simple prayer with me. Say, Father God, Thank you so much for loving me so much that you gave your only son to die on the cross for my sin. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today, I give my life to you. I repent of my sin, and I declare today, I am saved. Amen. If you prayed that prayer to give your life to Jesus, I want to ask you to do something just simple, two things. One, if you're in-house, our prayer team will be just to the left of the stage. You're right. Please go say, today I gave my life to Jesus. It'll change. When you those words come out of your mouth, you will absolutely feel something different, I promise you, just declaring your salvation. If you're not available and you're watching online, you're not here and they're not available to you, text the word SAVE to 405-500-1310. Let us know you're saved. Give us whatever that template allows you to do, your name, We'll be praying for you. Our prayer team will keep you in prayer throughout the weeks to come. But take that moment and do that. If you know somebody that's been sharing Jesus with you, call them and say, today I gave my life to Jesus. 
Would you help me walk this thing out? Because it is a journey, okay? At this time, I want to receive our tithes and offerings. It's, uh, it's that wonderful time of year again where there are so many things to do and so many uh, people that we have to deal with uh, and so many gifts that we have to buy and it's stuff. It's stuff. And I always tell people, I said, it's this time of year, I think all of us are probably most tested. What do I do? Who do I buy for? Yada, yada, yada. It's a lot of work. But this is where a priority comes in financially, where we say, my priority is God first. He gets the first fruit of my income. God gets the first fruit. It'll change everything. It'll be, it'll be painful in the beginning because it's like if you said, I want to have an apple orchard, you got seeds. But if I plant them, will they grow? That's always the question. But when you start seeing the first fruit of that come up, you'll never doubt again. You'll realize God's faithful. And so as you plant, know this. It may not come back to you today or tomorrow, but God is faithful. Whatever you sow, you will also reap. So if you want to give today, uh, there's a QR code on the screen behind me. You can put your smartphone on that. And uh, will lead you to a giving platform. You can also text the word GIVE to 405-546-2226. You can mail it in at 5821 Northwest Expressway, 73132, right here in Oklahoma City. Uh, You can give on your way out. Or you can go to our website, mosaicokc.church forward slash give. This time, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come to the left of the stage. You're right. Uh, If this is your first time here, we have a gift for you at the Welcome Kiosk. Please stop by and get it. It's kind of cute, kind of fun. Uh, Take us home with you. We'd sure love to have you come back. Um, And we are wishing you a Merry Christmas if we don't see you again. Uh, If uh, this priority doesn't start till January, then Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And uh, so anyway, uh, please stop by. If you want to get on my weekly call Wednesday nights, two minutes or less, strictly most of the time just an inspirational call in the middle of the week to kind of get you over the hump. Uh, you can text the word call to that number, 405-500-1310, and put your name and number in there. We'll put you on that list. Again, it's a two-minute or less call uh, that I do every Wednesday night. Also, if you want to serve, um, we've got that available more than you can ever imagine. It's always this cycle of serving, and so many of you do so much, and we thank you for that. But if you'd like to get involved in some area, where you get to know other people and uh, you, you're a part of a team, you can text the word SERVE to that same number, 405-500-1310. Please do that. And uh, if you need prayer, same number. Do the same thing. Let us know what your prayer need is. We want to be praying for you, okay? This time, we stand. We always go out with a shout of hallelujah on three. Uh, hoping you have a great holiday season. Um, Christmas this year is Wednesday. Thank you, Jesus. It's always hard on weekends, but we're glad. So love you so much. Let's go out with a shout. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.